all goes well, bearings run smoothly for years and years. But eventually, for one reason or another, they break down. Today, we're going to discuss ways that rolling contact bearings fail, some of the ways to remove a bearing, and some of the ways to install a bearing. When you're faced with a bearing that's failed and needs to be replaced, there are a few things you should check out. What it looks like, how it happened, and what caused it. It's important for you to notice these things because if you know why the bearing failed, you can take whatever steps are necessary to correct the situation. There are several types of bearing failure. Now, we're going to cover fatigue failure, lubrication failure, thrust failure, and misalignment failure first. All bearing failures have some signs in common. When a bearing is about to fail or after it has failed, some things will be evident. You will hear a lot of unusual noise. It will be running hot. The outside casing might feel hot if you touch it. And you might smell burnt oil. When you take the bearing apart, there may be other signs, such as blue or brown marks on the rollers or races. These are called burn marks. There may be spalled areas where pieces of the surfaces have flaked away. The retainer may be bent or broken. This one was taken out of a bearing that failed. The lubricant in that bearing was discolored and it did smell burnt. With each failure we discuss, we'll cover four points. What it is, what it looks like, what causes it, and what we can do to prevent it. Now with the first failure we're going to look at, fatigue failure, you should know up front that we can't prevent this type. We can only delay it. It happens to every bearing eventually. It means that the bearing wore out. The signs of fatigue failure could include any of the ones we mentioned earlier. Unusually loud bearing noise and vibration, high operating temperature, burn marks, uh, spalling on the balls or races, a bent or broken retainer, or cracks. Metal fatigue causes fatigue failure. The bearing might look rigid, but it isn't. The metal is continuously flexing or bending when the bearing's working. Both the balls or rollers and the races are squeezed again and again by the load on the bearing. We've exaggerated the amount of bending here so you can see what's happening more easily. Although the amount that a bearing bends is very small, it's significant because it goes on continually. There's a limit to how much flexing and bending the bearing metal can tolerate. When it's reached its limit, the metal fails. Bearings can go thousands, even hundreds of thousands of hours before fatigue failure occurs. But when it does, the bearing is useless and must be replaced. Fatigue failure can't be prevented. It can only be delayed. There are several things you can do to make sure a bearing will last as long as possible. Be sure the replacement bearing is the one needed to do the job. Use the manufacturer's specifications to determine which type you need. Then check the part number on the bearing to see if it's the same. Keep the bearing clean, install it carefully, and make sure that the machine is properly aligned and balanced. Taking the time to do it right will pay off in the long run. Let's go on to the next type, lubrication failure. As you know, the lubricant in a bearing is supposed to reduce friction and prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact. For the most part, high operating temperatures indicate lubrication failure although any type of failure can cause the bearing to overheat. The signs that a bearing's running hot are burn marks, discolored lubricant, and a burnt oil smell. When the temperature of the bearing gets too hot, something happens to the lubricant. It's said to burn. Now, this doesn't mean the lubricant burst into flames necessarily, but it changes. It begins to oxidize or combine with oxygen. Once this happens, the lubricant fails. Lubrication failure can be caused by improper lubrication as well. Improper lubrication could mean too much or too little lubricant in the bearing, using the wrong type of lubricant, or using contaminated lubricant in the bearing. Normal lubrication coats the surfaces of a bearing and prevents metal-to-metal -metal contact. However, too much oil or grease in the bearing causes excessively high fluid friction within the lubricant. You know that friction is the resistance to motion. In this case, the motion between the lubricant and the bearing. So it makes sense that the more lubricant there is, the more fluid friction there'll be. 
Fluid friction produces heat. When the temperature gets too high, the lubricant will burn. Too little lubricant in the bearing means friction can't be reduced effectively. It also means that metal-to-metal -metal contact can't be prevented. And when there's metal-to-metal -metal contact, the bearing surfaces wear down. All lubricants have certain properties or characteristics. If the bearing is filled with the wrong type of lubricant, it also causes problems. The wrong type of lubricant would be any type whose properties interfered with bearing operation. The right type of lubricant has certain properties that are essential for the bearing to function correctly. Often the type of lubricant needed is specified by the manufacturer for this reason. Now contamination is another cause of lubricant failure. Contaminants are produced at a very slow rate in most types of lubricant during normal operation. This is why lubricant must be either filtered or changed periodically. If it's not filtered or changed on schedule, contaminants build up in the lubricant and eventually it fails. And finally, we come to accidents. There's the possibility that lubricant that's already contaminated could accidentally be used to lubricate a bearing. This would also lead to lubrication failure. It's not hard to prevent lubrication failure. Just make sure you check the manufacturer's specifications to find out what kind of lubricant is needed and how often the oil or grease should be changed. Then be sure to follow through. The next type of failure we're going to look at has to do with how you handle the bearing. It's called thrust failure. It occurs when there's more axial load on a bearing than it can handle. The signs that go along with thrust failure are cracked rings and a sprung or broken retainer. If the retainer breaks, the balls or rollers might be rattling around in the bearing. Thrust failure can happen in a number of ways. It's inevitable if the wrong type of bearing is installed in a piece of equipment in the first place. Uh, let's say a shallow groove bearing was put into a position where it received thrust load. It would fail simply because it's not designed to handle it. Even when it's the right bearing for the job, you can still run into trouble if it's not installed correctly. There are two things to watch out for. The first is the way you position it, and the second is how much force you use. Be sure the bearing is correctly oriented or placed in the right direction. It sounds obvious, but it's still worth mentioning. Say an angular contact bearing was installed backward. The thrust load would be transmitted through it in the wrong direction, that is, its low shoulder would have to carry the load. Because the bearing isn't designed to carry load this way, it will fail. The second thing to be careful of is the amount of force you're putting on the bearing to get it in place. If you apply too much force, it's likely to crack right on the shaft. Before you replace a bearing, be sure it's the right type. Compare the new one with the one that failed and check the part number too. Make sure it's correctly oriented and don't use any more force than you have to when you're installing it. Later on, we'll go into more detail about the various steps involved in bearing installation. The next type of failure has something to do with installation too. It's called misalignment failure. A bearing's misaligned when one ring's out of line with the other. If this is why a bearing failed, you'll see unusual or abnormal wear marks on its races you'll notice that the wear pattern will run from side to side on one ring like this and be very wide on the other. A normal wear pattern follows the center of the race like this. Any condition that forces one ring out of line with the other can cause this type of failure. It could happen if a shaft was misaligned like this. Or if a shaft that was properly aligned started to bow after it was installed, like this. There are several things you can do to prevent misalignment failure. First of all, look at the shaft. Make sure it's not bowed. Then check the bearing seats. Those are the places where the bearing contacts the shaft or the housing. If you see any scratches or burrs, remove them. They could cause the inner ring to cock as it's moving up the shaft. After the bearing's in place, align the shaft carefully. Another way to minimize the chances of misalignment failure 
is to use a self-aligning bearing. But make sure that the one you use is capable of handling the load it will be subjected to. Let's stop here so you can review the four types of failures we've just covered. Fatigue, lubrication, thrust, and misalignment failures. Take a few minutes to read over the text material and get the answers to any questions you might have before going on. We just looked at four different types of bearing failures that you're likely to come across in the plant. Now we're going to look at three others, brinelling, false brinelling, and electric arcing failure. You won't come across these failures as often, but it's still important to be able to recognize them and to correct the situations that cause them when they do occur. We're going to deal with these failures the same way we dealt with the others. Find out what it is, what it looks like, what causes it, and what we can do to prevent it. Brunelling failure, the first type we'll talk about, leaves indentations or dents in the races and rolling elements of the bearing. You almost need a microscope to see some of these dents because they're so small. We've exaggerated the size of the dents here. In the plant, you might have to take a really close look at a failed bearing in order to find them. Running your hand lightly over the surface of the bearing might work too. These dents cause problems. Even the smallest ones make the bearing vibrate excessively. The bearing doesn't get dented when it's in operation. Brunelling occurs when the bearing's at rest, when it isn't working. This type of failure usually gets started during installation. The force that's used to press the bearing in place also forces the balls or rollers up against the races. If too much force is used, then both the rolling elements and races get dented. Now, one way to prevent brunelling is to make sure that the force you're applying when you're installing a bearing only touches the ring that is being mounted. Say it's an inner ring being press fit to a shaft. If the force applied during installation touches more than the inner ring, say it extends beyond it to the outer ring, brunelling will occur. By restricting the force to the ring that is being mounted, you eliminate the problem. Earlier we said brunelling only occurs when the bearing's at rest. So that means the only other situation you have to look out for is the time when the equipment is shut down. Don't subject the bearing to axial load when it's not moving. This will also cause brunelling. To sum it up, brunelling can be prevented by applying force correctly during installation and by not applying axial load to the bearing when it's not moving. False brunelling is the next type of failure we'll cover. It's like brunelling. It leaves indentations in the bearing and it only happens when the bearing's at rest. But it's different, too. First of all, false brunelling makes larger dents than brunelling does. And second, it's the motion of the balls or rollers inside the races that causes false brunelling. As you know, there's enough clearance in most bearings to allow the balls or rollers to move a little. But if something causes the balls or rollers to move back and forth for long periods of time, the lubricant in the bearing is forced out. Without lubrication in the bearing, you have metal-to-metal -metal contact. This eventually causes dents where they touch. False brunelling is caused by vibration that comes from some place outside of the bearing itself. These outside sources of vibration include other machines running in the same area, systems connected by piping that telegraphs vibrations to the bearing through the machine casing or vibrations caused by the movement of the machine when it's being shipped from one place to another. False brunelling can be prevented in several ways. One way is to eliminate the outside source of vibration by not running other machines around the one that is shut down. Another way is to lock the bearings down to prevent the movement of the rolling elements. Machines are often shipped with the bearings locked down. There are several ways to do this. Basically, you're just wedging the balls or rollers in place against the races to keep them from moving. A third way to prevent false brunelling is to periodically start up machines that have been out of operation for a while. This redistributes the lubricant in the bearings. Making sure that all the bearing surfaces are lubricated will prevent the metal-to-metal -metal contact that leads to dents. And finally, be sure to examine each new bearing carefully for brunelling before you install it. The last type of failure we're going to talk about is also caused by something outside of the bearing. 
It's called electric arcing. When this type of failure has occurred, you'll notice rough surfaces on the races and rolling elements, pits, like this. When the bearing's in operation, these pits cause it to vibrate excessively. Electric arcing failure occurs when a current passes through a bearing. The current creates an electric arc between the moving parts. The arc melts the surfaces of the bearing and the metal runs a little, leaving pits. Sometimes bearings and bearing housings are insulated to prevent current from passing through them. The insulation might be a plastic band that's bonded to a ring of the bearing, or a sheet that's placed underneath the housing. Making sure that you don't damage the insulation when you're installing the bearing or doing any routine work on the machine is the best way to prevent electric arcing failure. There's one situation when you need to take special precautions against electric arcing. That's when you're doing a weld repair. A welding machine could act as a source of current that causes arcing. To prevent this, ground your welding machine as close to the place that needs welding as possible. For example, let's say you're welding on a fan rotor. This is the rotor, and here is its shaft and bearing. The welding machine is here with a stinger cable and a grounding cable. If a ground is made right on the rotor, current doesn't have to pass through the bearings. If it were grounded elsewhere, the welding current could pass through the bearing that supports the rotor. This would create the arc that causes the bearing to fail. That finishes our discussion of rolling contact bearing failures. The ones we've covered are brinelling, false brinelling, and electric arcing. For each one, you should be able to understand what type of failure it is, what signs go along with it, what caused it, and how to prevent it. Keep these points in mind as you read over the material in your text. If you have any questions, clear them up now with your instructor while the material is fresh in your mind. We've already said that the most effective way to cope with bearing failure is to understand why a bearing failed and to take steps to prevent it from happening again. In order to find out why a bearing failed, it's usually necessary to remove it from the shaft. You recall that more often than not, rolling contact bearings are press fit onto shafts and push fit into their housings. Push fits are fairly loose as compared to press fits. For this reason, it's fairly simple to remove the bearing and shaft as a unit from the housing. Taking the bearing off the shaft is another matter, though. It's more difficult because the press fit is so tight. So in this segment, we're going to show you the two preferred methods of removing a press fit bearing from its shaft. First, we'll look at an arbor press, and then we'll go on to a bearing puller. The reason we'll start with these two is because they're the safest methods. There's little danger of further damaging the bearing or the shaft when you use either one of them. In the next segment, we'll discuss some other methods you might have to use. You may have already seen an arbor press around the plant. Basically, it's a machine that has a ram that moves under hydraulic power. Through hydraulic pressure that's supplied by a pump, the ram moves downward and applies pressure to whatever is being pressed. The bed, here, is the part of the press that the bearing rests on. It can be raised or lowered to accommodate larger or smaller items. The first step to setting up the press is to place table plates on the bed. These table plates are two large pieces of shim stock. They're used to support a bearing on the press. The next step is to decide which end of the shaft the bearing should come off of. Then you set this end up in the bed like this. Line the shaft up so that the ram is directly above it and center it so the table plates will support the inner ring of the bearing like this. This part is called a shaft protector. It's made of hardened metal. It's placed between the shaft and the ram and protects them both. Okay, the press is all set up. 
Before you start the press, put on your safety goggles. It is important to get the bearing off without damaging. But if something does go wrong and it breaks, the goggles will protect you from flying bits of metal. Bring the ram down slowly. Check to be sure that the shaft and the bearing are lined up. As the shaft starts to move through, make sure the bearing doesn't jump off its supports. Watch to see it isn't cocked either or it'll jam. Force the shaft straight down through the bearing until it's loose enough to be removed by hand. Get someone else to catch the shaft as it comes loose. If that's not possible, try to keep one hand free to hold on to the shaft so it won't drop to the ground and get damaged. It might be a good idea to put some rags down on the floor to cushion the shaft just in case it falls. Now the next method of removing a bearing that we'll look at is different from the Arbor Press in two ways. It's not hydraulically powered and it's portable. You can use a bearing puller to do the job. If you use the puller the right way, you can get the bearing off without breaking it or damaging the shaft. That's why it's one of the better methods to use. A bearing puller is made up of several parts that are assembled around the bearing and shaft. They are a set of puller jaws, which go behind the bearing, a pair of side rods that screw into the jaws, a strong back, which fits over the side rods, a lead screw that's threaded into the strong back, and a shaft protector that goes between the lead screw and the shaft. When the lead screw is turned, the puller applies force to the bearing, which pulls it off the shaft. Let's take a closer look at the part called the jaws. Now they're slightly angled on one side and they're concave or hollowed out on the other. They taper to a sharp edge here so they can be forced in behind the bearing easily. If both sides of the jaws were flat, they couldn't fit into tight spaces as well. The angle side of the jaws goes against the bearing so that the jaws only push against the inner ring. This is important because if the jaws pushed against the outer ring, the jaws would damage the bearing. We're going to see the puller take a bearing off the shaft now, but there's one more thing to check before beginning. Make sure the soft jaws, these soft pieces of metal here, are on the vise. Next, put a little penetrating oil between the shaft and the bearing. Set the jaws up behind the bearing. They should be placed loosely against the shaft. Screw both rods into the jaws. Take time to make sure you've screwed them both in the same amount. This is important because if you screw one in more than the other, the whole assembly will be out of line. Now place the lead screw in position and put the strong back in place. This particular strong back just slides in from the top. Then put the shaft protector between the lead screw and the shaft and tighten the lead screw on the strong back. By the way, another way to make sure the puller is correctly aligned is to wait until it's all assembled. Then you can turn the nuts on the outside rods until you've got the lead screw lined up with the shaft. Using a wrench, tighten up the puller and draw the bearing off the shaft. Watch the bearing carefully while it moves off the shaft to be sure it isn't cocked. If it's cocked, it'll jam. If it does become cocked, stop, readjust the puller, and start all over again. Keep pulling the bearing until it's loose enough for you to take off by hand. Now sometimes it's necessary to use heat to help the process along. In that case, a torch might be used to heat the bearing until it expands. If you do this, however, you'll destroy the bearing. So, try to do the job using only the puller. Now that you've got the bearing off, handle it carefully to keep it from getting dirty. You don't rotate it either. Any dirt that's already inside the bearing will cause more damage if it's rotated. Banging it or dropping it will also further damage the bearing, and it'll make the task of finding out why it failed harder. It's time to examine the bearing. The first step is to clean it up. If the signs of damage are subtle ones, like those caused by brunelling or misalignment failure, you won't be able to see them until you've gotten the lubricant out of the bearing. 
Begin by soaking the bearing in solvent for several hours. This will loosen up most of the grease and dirt in the bearing. Then take the bearing out and rinse it in clean solvent. Let the solvent flow through the bearing until it runs clear. Then use a brush to remove any traces of grease that are still sticking to the bearing. Put on a pair of goggles before the next step of drying the bearing with compressed air. Direct the air through the bearing, but don't allow the force of the air to spin the bearing. This might sound like a quick way to get the job done, but the force could make the bearing spin so fast that it disintegrates. Spinning the bearing too fast is dangerous, so take the time to direct the air through the bearing correctly. After it's dry, inspect the bearing for signs of failure. Then turn it slowly while examining the races and rolling elements. Watch out for stiffness or binding as the balls or rollers turn. When you figured out why the bearing failed, throw it out so someone else won't come along and use it by mistake. So far, we've covered the two best methods of pulling a bearing off a shaft, the arbor press and the bearing puller. Then we talked about how to handle the bearing after it's off the shaft, how to clean it, and how to inspect it. We'll talk about other removal methods in a few minutes, but right now, read over the material in your text and be sure you understand the procedures well enough to do them yourself. When it's not possible to use a bearing puller or an arbor press, you've got to try something else. Let's say you can't get the shaft and bearing out to take it to the press, and you can't get the puller jaws in behind the bearing. You've got to find another way to do the job. We're going to cover a few alternatives that you might want to consider. But bear in mind that with each of these methods, you run the risk of damaging the bearing or the shaft. So use them only as a last resort. The first method we'll look at involves a gear puller like this. It's used to pull a gear and a bearing off at the same time. The parts of the gear puller look a lot like the ones on a bearing puller, but they aren't exactly the same. The gear puller jaws are actually hooks that can be positioned on a gear. If the bearing is located near enough to a gear to use this method, the first step is to attach the jaws to the gear. Now, line up the threaded rod with the shaft. Insert the shaft protector between the rod and the shaft. Take a second to be sure everything's lined up okay. Then use the wrench to tighten the puller. Start slowly and keep checking to be sure that neither the gear nor the bearing are cocked or they'll jam. If they do, stop, correct the problem, readjust the puller, then start again. By the way, don't ever attach a gear puller directly to a bearing. If you do, you'll damage the bearing because the gear puller will be pulling on the outer ring. The next method we're going to talk about doesn't involve pulling the bearing off. Instead, we'll knock it loose. You can sometimes use a drift like this one to remove a bearing from its shaft. This is an ordinary drift with a round end. You could also use another type of drift that has a semicircular end. If you were to use a semicircular drift, you'd place the flat side nearest the shaft. It's the same procedure with either type. We're going to use a round end drift to show you how to do it. The purpose of the drift is to direct the force from a hammer against the inner ring of the bearing to knock it off the shaft. Before you start, put on eye protection. You'll need it if chips fly off the bearing or the drift. Working around the ring, tap the drift with a hammer once, then move to the next location and tap the drift once again until you've got that bearing moving. Be careful not to let the drift touch the shaft. Once the bearing is moving, be sure to balance the tapping to prevent the bearing from cocking on the shaft and jamming. Now the main disadvantage of this method is that keeping the ring from jamming is difficult. Even though it can be freed easily, the ring gouges the shaft every time it jams. This damages the shaft. So if you have a better alternative to the drift method, use it. Now let's consider what to do when a bearing seizes on a shaft. Sometimes when the failure is severe, the bearing's retainer breaks up. 
In that case, it's not too difficult to remove the outer ring and the balls or rollers from the shaft, but the inner ring is something else. If it has seized on the shaft, probably none of the methods we've talked about so far will provide enough force to move the inner ring. In order to remove a ring that's seized on a shaft, you have to split it. The ring's made of a hardened steel and brittle enough to crack. Make sure you've got your face protection on before you begin. It might be possible to crack the ring with the first blow, but it's unlikely. This ring is too thick, so we'll cut part way through it with a grinder and a cutting disc. You can't use the grinder to cut it all the way through, though, or the disc will damage the shaft. We'll estimate how deep we can cut and still leave a safe margin, then stop. That's close enough. Now we start to hit the ring with the chisel. You may have to hit it several times. Hit the ring until you see a crack. After it cracks, you'll be able to pull it off the shaft. Remember, splitting the ring of the bearing in order to remove it should be your last move. Not only is the bearing destroyed, but there's a good chance the shaft will be too. Let's review what we've covered during this segment. We talked about two methods of removing a bearing, using a gear puller and using a drift. We also stress the fact that both of these methods are more likely to damage the bearing and the shaft. They ought to be used only if the arbor press or bearing puller can't be used for the job. Then we talked about a way to remove an inner ring that seized on a shaft, splitting it with a chisel. But we also said that this method is really hard on the shaft and should only be used as a last resort. Take a moment now to look over this material in your text. Then talk it over with your instructor and the rest of the class. If you know some different ways of removing a bearing, this would be a good time to bring them up. A bearing failed. It's been removed. It's time to talk about installing the new one. Let's review the steps you've already taken to reach this point. You know why the old bearing failed. You check to be sure that it wasn't because it was the wrong type for the job. And you've checked the part number for the replacement bearing. The area where you'll be installing the new bearing is clean and all set up with the tools needed to do the job. The replacement bearing wasn't unwrapped until you needed it, so it didn't get dirty while you were setting up. The old bearing was compared with the new one. The part number was rechecked and you inspected the new bearing carefully for damage. The parts will fit together right because you've measured the shaft and the inner ring. And you made certain that they fell within the range specified by the manufacturer. If the bearing needed greasing, it's been hand packed. Sounds like a lot of work, and it is. But it saves time in the long run because it prevents unnecessary bearing failure. We're going to cover two methods of installing a bearing. The first method involves using an arbor press. In the second method, we'll install a bearing using a tubular drift. Using the arbor press method, the first step is to set up the press. Adjust the bed of the press according to the length of the shaft. Place the supports for the bearing on the bed then set the bearing on the supports. Be sure to line the bearing up so it's directly under the ram. The bearing must be placed on the table plates so that its inner ring is supported. This will prevent force from the ram from damaging the bearing. Then lubricate the shaft and place it into the bearing. Check to see that the shaft is lined up with the ram and put on the shaft protector. Check again to be sure everything's lined up, then start the press slowly. Keep an eye on the shaft as it moves into the bearing. The movement should be smooth. If it's not, the bearing might be jammed, so stop. Correct whatever's causing the problem and start again. Continue to press until the bearing's right where you want it. Say it's up against the shoulder of the shaft. 
check to make sure that the entire surface of the inner ring is touching the shaft all the way around. Then stop. If you continue to press after this point, you'd put too much force on the inner ring and damage the bearing. The last step is to remove the bearing and the shaft from the press. The second method we're going to talk about involves using a tubular drift like this one. It looks like an ordinary piece of pipe. In fact, sometimes a piece of pipe is used to make a drift. This method has the advantage of being quick and simple. Except for the specific tools needed to do this job, all of the points we mentioned earlier when we talked about getting ready to do an installation with the Arbor Press are necessary here too. Checking the bearing, keeping the work area clean, and so forth. To install the bearing, you're going to need some shaft lubricant, a mallet, a vise, safety goggles, and a drift. Be sure the drift you use is wide enough to fit over the shaft, like this, and is the same size as the inner ring. However, the drift must not be so wide that it touches the rolling elements or the outer ring. A drift this large could damage the bearing. The next step is to place the shaft in a vise that has soft jaws and make sure the shaft is secure. Then lubricate the part of the shaft that the bearing will have to slide over. After that's done, push the bearing onto the shaft by hand as far as it will go. Place the drift over the shaft, checking again to make sure it doesn't touch the surface of the outer ring. Make sure you've put on eye protection at this point. Pound the drift against the bearing until you've got the bearing right where it ought to be. Check to be sure that the inner ring is flush against the shaft. And it's done. As we said, it's a simple enough method so long as you have a drift that's the right size for the job. That covers two of the common techniques used to install a bearing. Take some time now to look over the material we've just covered in your text and answer the questions you'll find there. Both of the methods you've just seen used a lot of force to get the bearing in place. With the methods we'll cover next, much less force is needed to accomplish the same job. We're going to use a change in the temperature of one of the parts either the shaft or the bearing, to get the press fit. In other words, we'll cool the metal of one part to make it smaller in size or heat it up to make it bigger. It's possible to change the size of either the bearing or the shaft for a few minutes so it can be slipped into place by hand. When the temperature of the part returns to normal, the part's back to its regular size and you've got a press fit or a shrink fit, as it's sometimes called. Even though the bearing and the shaft heat up or cool down while the machine's operating, the press fit holds. The fit doesn't change because both parts are getting hot or cold at the same time. There are several ways of changing the temperature of the shaft or the bearing. We're going to talk about five of them. Two ways of changing the temperature of the shaft, first using dry ice, then using liquid nitrogen, Next, we'll see three ways of changing the temperature of the bearing using an electric light, an air oven, and an oil bath. The first method involves cooling the shaft with dry ice to make it smaller. Put the shaft into a container and pack the dry ice around it. Make sure you're wearing some gloves to protect your hands while you're working with dry ice. It's cold enough to freeze your hands if they aren't protected. In an hour or less, the dry ice should have made the shaft small enough. With gloves on, take the shaft out of the container and slip the bearing into place. Wait a few minutes until the shaft is back to room temperature. Then check the position of the bearing and you're done. 
Another way that you can decrease the size of the shaft is to use liquid nitrogen instead of dry ice. The principle is the same. You use the liquid nitrogen to cool the shaft, but the procedure is a little bit different. You'll find more details on how to do it in your text. Now, instead of cooling a part to make it smaller, you could heat it up to expand it. The methods we're going to talk about next do use the opposite approach. Instead of cooling the shaft, we'll heat up the bearing. But before you use any of these methods, you need to check out how much heat the bearing you're working with can stand. A good rule of thumb is don't heat the bearing to more than 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 120 degrees centigrade. But it's a good idea to look at the manufacturer's specifications or check with your supervisor so you'll know exactly what's right for your situation. The amount of heat a bearing can take and the right way to measure the temperature of a bearing are facts you need to know. Heating a bearing with an electric light bulb is the first method we'll look at. It's simple to do. All you need to get started is a light bulb, a metal funnel, gloves, and a crayon. The crayon is made of a special material that melts at a particular temperature. It's used to mark the bearing. The markings melt when the bearing's hot enough to be removed. In the setup you see here, the funnel is placed over the light bulb. The inner ring of the bearing goes on top of the funnel. Using the funnel keeps the weight of the bearing off the light bulb. It usually takes about an hour to get it hot enough. Then you lift it off and put it on the shaft. After it's cooled, check to make sure it's in the right position. The next method uses an air oven. It's faster than the light bulb method. Usually it takes about 15 minutes. You put the bearing in the oven. After you've checked out what the temperature should be and how much time it takes to heat the bearing up, you adjust the dial on the thermostatic control. An air oven's a lot like the oven in a kitchen stove. It's thermostatically controlled to maintain a certain temperature. The oven can probably give out more heat than the bearing can stand, so it's important to set the control properly. Otherwise, the heat could damage the bearing. For example, it could burn up all the lubricant in it. When the bearing has reached the proper temperature, take it out of the oven and put it on the shaft. After it's cooled down, check it for position as usual. The last method we'll talk about is heating a bearing in an oil bath. Doing it this way involves heating the bearing in a container of oil on a hot plate. To set up, you need a thermometer, a container big enough to hold the bearing, a device to keep the bearing off the bottom of the container. We're using a hook. Gloves to protect your hands and a hot plate. The first step in the process is to pour cold oil into a container. Pour in as much oil as you think you'll need to cover the bearing. Then take the bearing and place it on a hook. Hang the hook over the edge of the container. You might want to check to make sure the bearing's completely immersed in the oil. Attach a thermometer to the inside of the container so you'll know when the oil's hot enough. Then it's just a matter of placing the container on the hot plate and setting the thermostat to the level that you need to heat up the oil to the right temperature. When you figure the bearing's been in there long enough to expand it so that it'll go on to the shaft easily, it's time to take it out. Make sure you're wearing gloves for this step. It is difficult to pick things up with bulky gloves on, especially small things like this bearing here. But that bearing's hot enough to take the skin off your fingers, so don't go for speed, go for safety. Slip it into place on the shaft. Let it cool so you can check its position. If it's in the right place, the job's complete.
Each method of installing a bearing we've looked at so far dealt with an inner ring that was press fit on a shaft. But you should realize that the arbor press, the tubular drift, and the temperature alteration techniques we've just covered can also be used to press fit outer rings in their housings. The principles remain the same, although the actual steps are different. For example, to press fit an outer ring in a housing, you might heat the housing rather than the bearing, or you might chill a bearing instead of its shaft. Well, that wraps up what we have to say about rolling contact bearings. We've covered the various types of rolling contact bearing failures. You know what they are, what they look like, what causes them, and how to prevent them. We've looked at some of the ways to remove a bearing so it can be cleaned up and inspected, and then we went over several techniques you can use to reinstall a bearing. Read over the text material on how to use temperature to install a bearing. Then clear up any questions you might have with your instructor. You might want to take the time to review the earlier portions, too, so that the next time you've got a failed bearing on your hands, you'll be able to do more than replace it. You'll be able to identify the situation that caused it and correct it.